back a bit. We have to survive. There's more to life than money, Ellie. Like loyalty, John, and love. Have I ever denied you either? Go on, say it out loud. Do you think I care more for money than I do for you? He threw his cigarette onto the ground and crushed it under his boot. No, Ellie, I don't. I sensed he had wanted to fight, but had suddenly lost the will. I threw my arms around his neck and said, I love you, John, more than anything else, more than all the money in the world. His arms were weak around my waist, his hold loose. I kissed him with the reassuring affection of a mother more than the longing of a wife. Let's go back inside, I'm frozen. Go on, he said, I'll follow you. As I turned, he bent and rescued the half-smoked cigarette butt from the ground, studying the shreds of tobacco in his palm before dropping them into his pocket. All these bits of paper here. The extraordinary cultural and moral gap between us and the generation where, um, okay, I'm completely discombobulated now because I don't have all my wonderful tape material of my grandmother talking and I was really hoping that she was gonna help me out. The next reading that I'm going to do is um, based on one of the tapes, which is just wonderful, where my grandmother is talking about sprees, which were these house parties that were held in people's homes when she was growing up. And she's talking about everybody. There were, there were um, in the days that my grandmother was growing up, sort of at the beginning of the century in the west of Ireland, most marriages were arranged at that time. But people still had these wonderful romances uh, that came out of these sprees or house parties that people had. And I suppose they were the equivalent of discos. And they had them like every weekend and they were like big Irish weddings held in people's houses. And um, she, there was this wonderful extract from the tape where she's talking about um, looking, in, looking in the window and seeing uh, at the age of seven and seeing the women, you know, in the white, they all wore white blouses up to here. And gradually, incrementally, as she grew older year by year, the skirt seemed to get slightly shorter. But one of the things that she says in the tape, which I love, is she's talking at the end about um, uh, the, the skirts were getting shorter. And then one year, the big thing happened where uh, the women started to cut off their hair. So they had this long hair down to here, and the women started to cut their hair short like mine are now. And she said the old women were just standing around saying, oh, they're cutting their hair, what will they do next? And of course, what women did next was an awful lot more than just cut their hair. So what I wanted to do was just read an extract from the book, which is about this relationship that Ellie has with her appearance and beauty, coming from a place where everything was very ordinary, everything was very simple, everything was very plain, and then coming over to America and discovering all of this artifice and all of this makeup and uh, dressing up and cutting our hair and discovering all this extraordinary stuff, which to a young woman at that time, as much as it is to young women now, seemed like it was very, very important. You look awful, Ellie, Sheila said, tugging at the sides of my dress. You'll never pass. Pass is what, I said. It's the hair that gives you away. Sheila had been hinting that I should cut my hair from the first day I arrived in New York. I always kept it a good few inches past my shoulders, but it had grown beyond that again, and I was loath to ask my friend to trim it back for me in case she cut it too short. Sheila's eyes were shining with excitement and I caught the flash of blue steel in them as she pulled a pair of dressmaking scissors out of rape from pocket and held them over my ponytail. Go on, Ellie, let me. A bob would look great, you'll be all the rage. I hesitated, perhaps she was right, but I loved my long hair. At night, John would take the brush from me and pull it down gently from mood to end and run his fingers through it, languishing in the otherness of its softness and length. Snap! Taking advantage, taking advantage of my hesitation as a yes, Sheila had sliced through my ponytail. I screamed as my hair sprang up, suddenly gathered in two blunt waves at my ears. Oh no, Sheila, what have you done? I reached into the space where my hair had been and felt the lightness around my neck. Instinctively, I reached down and picked the still tied ponytail up from the floor. A part of me that had been touched and admired by my husband now lay in my lap, a lifeless lump of waste. 
I let out a shocked sob, but Sheila took no heed of me, only fluffing the sides down around my face and saying, there now, that looks so much better already. She chatted away over the top of my silent shock for the next little while. She ironed my hair and powdered my face and rouged my cheeks. Reluctantly, I conceded to her prodding and bossing me into several changes of dress and stockings and pointed shoes. After a while, my anger became tempered by curiosity at the transformation that was taking place in the mirror. A different woman was beginning to appear in front of me. When she had finished, we stood side by side in front of the mirror and she pouted, curse and damn you, Ellie Flaherty, but you look more of a lady than I do. My hair was short and straight, tempered into dark points that sliced across my cheekbones. Sheila had lined my eyes in black coal and they looked larger and bluer, an exaggerated version of themselves. My skin, always freckled at home, was now pale from the months I had spent indoors and made me look sophisticated and older. Sheila had finally chosen me a dress in dark, dark navy with a mannish, wide-collared jacket of the same shade that came down as far as my mid-length, as my mid-thigh. I bent my head so she could hang a long string of glittering glass baubles around my neck. They fell almost to my waist. She touched the bare nape of my neck and said, you look magnificent. The other thing um, that I, I found, find interesting, I mean, I'm very lucky because I live, in the, I live in the west of Ireland and I see my mother every day. And so I'm actually living a life where I'm, 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 I'm kind of straddling it on top of my own family history. My mother lives in the house that my grandparents bought, um, so the house that, that she grew up in, and it's never been lived in by anyone else except for our family. And I knew my grandmother very well, but my mother also keeps that family thread going. You know, so it's always a subject of interest in our house, the difference between my life today and the life of my grandmother and how that, that, how that has been affected by history, if you like. And um, one of the things that, um, that is of, of great interest to me as a writer and which I kind of tend to fill my books with, it is the, the, everyday, um, the everyday kind of life of the Irish housewife or the regular housewife today, the quotidian, all of the details, all of the little tasks that we undertake every day. And of course, we all still have to flip and undertake them, even if we've got full-time jobs now. But the, and the way in which a lot of those crafts and a lot of those skills of my grandmother's day um, have, have been lost to us in one you know, swoop and in one, uh, and in one great generation. Um, and, um, you know, and the realities of that. I mean, when I was growing up, um, the, the message that I got from my mother was very much, you know, um, you know, my mother was really determined, as was her mother, not to repeat my grandmother's history. Uh, my grandmother was uh, trained as a teacher in Ireland, which was a very, very difficult thing to do around the 1920s and 30s. And she never got, she couldn't, she could never speak Irish. So she was never qualified to train to teach in Ireland. So she had to go to England. She went to England as a young woman. Um, she learned how to teach over there. She got a teaching job. She came home on holiday and then she got my, she met my grandfather and she got married and she was never allowed to work again because under the law, under the laws of Deborah Lair at that time, women weren't allowed to work. They had to stay at home and create this wonderful vision of Ireland um, that he had after the war. And so my grandmother was never allowed to work. And she, so she was very, very determined um, that both of her daughters would enroll in teacher training schools and become teachers and have this wonderful emancipated life um, that she didn't have. Uh, my mother also moved to England, but I think that like, and she, she did teach, but I think even herself, but an awful lot of women of that generation that were living in big cities during the 60s, and I think that New York was probably the same as London at that time, they were listening to Joan Myers on the radio and they were reading um, Erica Young and they had all of these wonderful feminist sensibilities, but it was all kind of over there and it wasn't encroaching in any way, shape or form on the suburban lives that they had. You know, they were still, um, they were still having to wash Terry nappies and struggle with their twin tubs. And so they really, they really jacked it up for my generation. I mean, they were like, my mother used to say, thing, her, her thing was, any idiot can get married any idiot can wash a dish, 
ADHD